Um, so, you know, there's a lot of ways to categorize breast cancer reconstruction. One way to do that is, um, is to distinguish between prosthetic and autologous modalities. Can, can you tell us what that difference is all about? Yeah, so that's the central divergence or dichotomy in breast reconstruction. Are you going to use your own tissue? And typically that means coming from the abdomen, although there are alternatives where we take it from the thighs or from the back, or it's using some sort of implant-based reconstruction. And in broad strokes, the benefit of implant-based reconstruction tends to be that it's a quicker surgery, quicker healing, and it's just a little less um, invasive. The drawbacks of implant-based reconstruction is they, you're using a fallible material. You're using a, essentially an implant that can rupture, it can have malposition issues. And uh, oftentimes if it's a younger patient, the idea that this fallible material at some point will require more surgery and revision is, is reasonably high. On the other side is the autologous reconstruction. The benefit of that is it's all your own tissue. So a woman's abdomen, which oftentimes, for some at least, can be a source of, um, of excess tissue that's unwanted, that can then be used in um, a nice elegant symmetry of taking where you have too much to where you need it, which is up in the breast. And so it makes a lot of sense. Natural tissue, it's all your own. It looks and feels natural. Um, the downside of that is that it's a, it's a much bigger surgery. So oftentimes now we use microsurgery. And what does that entail? It means that we're gonna open up the, uh, the internal mammaries, expose them, and we're gonna do microsurgery to connect the deep inferior epigastric vessels or sometimes the superior or the superficial ones. And we're gonna connect the artery and vein with a microscope um, and then put them on kind of uh, some anticoagulation sometimes, but basically put them under monitoring generally for at least a few days in the ICU or some other um, high intensity observation ward. And there's gonna be a bit of healing. Uh, the healing generally will be two times longer uh, than what the prosthetic reconstruction would be. So, you know, pros and cons with both. And I think most of us do a combination of both. Although um, for my purpose, practice. Personally, I'm tending to do a lot more prosthetic reconstruction than I did in the past. But in general, those are the two options open to women. And if you look at statistics nationally, um, approximately 80% of all breast cancer reconstructions, and there's over 100,000 done every year in the US, are actually implant-based reconstruction. And 20% are autologous. So, I mean, the fact that a woman has choice is critical here. And the fact that most um, breast reconstruction centers and surgeons will offer a choice is also important. Are you uh, seeing a change in those trends over time? Is autologous becoming more or less popular? Or do you think that 80-20 split is about stable? Um, I think slowly uh, there's been a creep towards prosthetic reconstruction. I think prosthetic reconstruction is a little bit more amenable to some of these newer techniques and technologies, which I'm sure we'll kind of go into in more depth. Um, and so I think it's just become a little bit more uh, popular, but not there's no seismic shift in in the in those numbers. I think they've been steadily, but in in small perceptible amounts changing, but uh, generally um, favoring uh, prosthetic reconstruction. Are there? Um, I, I recognize that obviously um, the woman or patient having a choice is uh, very valuable to to that patient. Um, are there countervailing clinical factors that would uh, make you suggest one way versus uh, the other? Yeah, for sure. So, so again, that, that centrality of choice is important. Um, but for instance, if you have a younger patient who doesn't have cancer, but is getting, let's say, nipple sparing mastectomies, prophylactic mastectomies, then oftentimes the, uh, there are two issues there. One is uh, there may not be a, enough soft tissue in the abdomen for some of these younger patients to actually get a reasonable breast reconstruction in terms of volume. So, so the idea of having sufficient uh, repository of fat in the abdomen is one issue. 
Uh, the second issue is that some of these younger patients, they're, they're not looking for a six to eight week downtime. They want to get back to work. Sometimes they have young children. Um, they want to get back to their lives. So there's this uh, kind of overriding psychological imperative that I want to spend less time in the hospital, less time healing and get back to my life quicker. So, so that oftentimes drives that, um, that kind of propensity towards the prosthetic reconstruction. But there are certain situations in which autologous would absolutely be mandated. Um, and they generally revolve around radiation. So radiation, as we know, is a central part of breast cancer uh, treatment. And you can have radiation before the decision to have a mastectomy or after. So, so in both those settings, they pose a problem for um, breast reconstruction. So let's say a scenario in which a patient has had a lumpectomy, uh, had radiation, and unfortunately develops a recurrence. So that radiated tissue, even if it's been more than five years, 10 years, even, you know, a, a great deal of time has passed since the radiation, there's a permanent vascular injury to the skin that will affect any attempt to manipulate it uh, with reconstruction. And typically what we say, studies that we've done at Northwestern have actually shown that if you try doing a mastectomy with an expander and an implant, and you know that's one of the things we'll go into later uh, with prosthetic reconstruction, the chances for failure are upwards of 40%. So even if you've done that lumpectomy long ago, the skin has had a chance to heal apparently on the surface. Inside, there is a, a chronic uh, uh, deleterious effect to the microvasculature of the skin such that when you go ahead and try to put the expander implant in 40% of the time, that will fail. So given that information, oftentimes when we have that scenario where patients already had radiation and we tell them, listen, your chances for failure of this reconstruction, if we were to use an implant-based reconstruction, is 40%. You know, maybe we're better off using autologous. So that would be our gentle pressure towards that. Now, there are patients who, again, with primacy of choice being here, who say, wait a second, it's 40%, but that means 60% of the time it works. I don't want to deal with A, B, and C, all those issues with, with uh, autologous reconstruction. I'm afraid of being under surgery under the knife for such a long period of time. Can we please just do the prosthetic? And of course, we will be amenable to, to considering that. So that's scenario one in which we, we know patients have radiation. What's scenario, what's scenario two like where we have um, a patient who's planning a mastectomy and may have post-mastectomy radiation? So if we know that already, let's say they've got bulky axillary uh, metastasis and we know that they're gonna need that, then the same applies because the, the, the failure rate of an expander implant reconstruction can be 30 to 40% in that setting as well. So again, knowing that there may be radiation upfront in our journey, we may kind of try to give patients that heads up and then consider doing a reconstruction. But if we do an autologous reconstruction in that setting, we don't necessarily want to do that up front because again, you put the flap on right after a mastectomy and immediate reconstruction, but then you radiate after it, then that flap, the tissue is gonna get um, irreversibly affected by the radiation in such a fashion where it can turn tight, contracted, it can get misshapen, and it's very difficult for us to do anything with that because we've already used the frontline option of the autologous reconstruction, typically from the tummy. So what we try to do when we know that radiation may be coming up front and both the patient and the surgeon agree that they wanna avoid an implant reconstruction is we'll delay the flap reconstruction, delay the autologous reconstruction until after the radiation. And there's some, as you can see, there start to be kind of multiple uh, iterative kind of permutations that kind of come into play here. And so we can at that point delay the autologous reconstruction and we can delay it and just leave it flat and then come back after a period of time. Uh, typically it's at least six months, but sometimes it can be longer, a year or more, and then do the flap reconstruction or we can put in a spacer expander. So that's called it's a very confusing term, but it's called immediate delay because we are doing something immediately, which is putting the expander to hold the skin envelope open, 
but we're delaying the definitive volume replacement, the flap reconstruction, until after the radiation is done. And the kind of the outcomes of both of those delayed types of reconstruction are a little bit um, uh, variable from patient to patient. And there are preferences that are surgeon dependent. So some people will say, okay, if you have bulky metastasis, you're gonna get post mastectomy radiation, guess what? We're not gonna do anything at all. You're gonna get a, a mastectomy. You're gonna be flat for a year. And then we're gonna have you uh, work with the plastic surgeons to then get the definitive reconstruction. Or other centers like MD Anderson and Northwestern, what we'll say is, okay, we know we're gonna have to do a flat for you, but we don't wanna leave you flat. We wanna give you some semblance of tissue. We wanna actually keep that tissue from contracting as much. So what we're gonna do is put in this spacer expander during that time. And then after the radiation's done, while we have a little bit of more kind of uh, expansibility of this tissue, we're gonna keep the expander in place and then we're gonna take it out and then replace that volume with the uh, flap. And so that that's with radiation, those are some of the kind of the nuanced ways we can think about uh, timing and, and reconstruction. But that would be your original question. Is there something that really pushes you one way versus the other? And it, it if it's not patient-based factors, uh, it's to do with radiation. Wow. And uh, like you've mentioned that you really can see how the permutations can grow from patient to patient. So, you know, I, I respect the plastic surgeons tremendously. You guys are really taking each case and, and making, you know, patient specific choices for their reconstructive plan. Yeah. And so I think that that is, is a key. And, and again, there, that's, that's the, that's the, the benefit, but that's the kind of the catch 22 of some of these reconstructive techniques is that you, you've got sometimes so many choices. It's not very, it's not as straightforward. Um, it's not a choice between let's say an open versus a laparoscopic procedure. Um, you've got literally, um, you know, at each level, maybe two choices that are multiplied by, you know, three levels. So you end up with two to third or eight different choices lining up in front of you. And, and so you have to think about what those issues are, but of course, you know, this still is, and it's always important to bring it back for the patient that what the plastic surgeon does is not as important as what the breast surgeon and your breast oncology team do for you. And, and so sometimes that gets lost in the uh, complexity. So uh, oftentimes I'll see my patients right after they've seen the breast surgeon and it's already a dramatic, um, disheartening situation for them. They've, they've, you know, just found out they have breast cancer from the biopsy. They, they've just found out they're gonna need a mastectomy. They're gonna have to take time off work and, and they're gonna have to get chemo, maybe radiation. And then they come up upstairs to the plastic surgeon's office and he's trying to talk to you about like things that seem superficial to you at the time. And so what, what we try to do is maintain a respectful secondary background position to the primary issue of, of the life-saving breast surgical therapies. But we try to remind the patient that, listen, the great majority of, of the experience here is that you're going to be fine. You're going to survive. You're going to be cancer-free forever. You're going to get back to your life. And so in that great majority of circumstances, it's important that we at least make some decisions that pertain to how you're going to, how the quality of life will be afterwards. And so some patients will come to us saying, you know, I only care about the breast cancer. I don't want to talk about reconstruction, especially with all of these nuances and these permutations, you're just confusing me. I just, why can't I do it afterwards? And the problem is, so why can't we do a delayed reconstruction is that once those tissues have had a chance to kind of collapse and settle down, um, it's not easy to go back and do the reconstruction. Number one, it's a second surgery and it's a needless second surgery because because we could have done the reconstruction at the same time as the mastectomy. And secondly, those tissues, once if the you've got- The planes are obliterated, it's gonna to be tough to get into there. Yeah. It, it makes it tougher. And sometimes uh, you lose something in terms of the final outcome because you've waited. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fine line and it's a, um, you have to be careful to respect the, 
the important oncologic role of resecting the cancer, but reminding patients that, listen, in, in a few months, you're going to be cancer free. And so you have to think about what, what, your, what your priorities will be. So there's kind of this Bayesian kind of um, analysis where you're going to have something different later on in your life that depends upon you making some of those decisions now. So that's where we, again, take that respectful background secondary role, but it's important that we, we, we lay the foundation for their future quality of life at the time of their mastectomy. So we've gotten a, a glimpse now at the complexity of the work that you do, Dr. Kim. Uh, I wanna start by kind of digging in a little more about prosthetic breast reconstruction, um, the exact kind of logistical steps that go into that. Um, so, so some of my friends are sometimes uh, actually confused or a beginning intern might be a little confused that what you're placing um, prosthetic wise, at least at the outset is not actually, is, is often not the, uh, the final implant, but it's a tissue expander. Right. Um, can so you say, yeah, exactly. That, that's not only somewhat perplexing to interns, but it's also perplexing to patients as well. You know, why don't you just put the implant in? You, you're saying you've got, so you've, you either do a nipple sparing or skin sparing. And most of the decision for that, by the way, is, is driven by the, uh, oncology situation. So what I mean by that is that if the tumor is relatively far away from the nipple and, you know, some people use a two centimeter, some people are a little less, some people go as far as four centimeters, but it's really uh, breast surgeon dependent in my, per from my perspective, we let them choose, is this enough? Um, then, then we go ahead and, and, you know, mark out what that would be. And there are signs, there are rare times when um, a breast surgeon says, you know what, I can do a nipple sparing. And we look at the patient and they're so totic, they have so much skin that it would be hard and relatively unsafe in terms of a flat perfusion for us to do, to do a nipple sparing because we need to cut out that central part of the where the nipple is to get access. You're saying that there would be so much skin left behind that's devascularized that you might encounter some skin flap necrosis. That's why you might actually just go ahead and do a, you know, right. a, a more skin um, taking approach. Exactly. The skin sparing approach, which obviously means taking the nipple. So that, that given that situation, that in both cases, whether it's nipple sparing or skin sparing, there's just skin left around. So it's like a tent in which the poles have been removed. So why not go ahead and just re-pop that tent open, re-expand that space with an implant right away. And it has to do with that point you made about the vascularity. So it's my belief that the great majority of the blood supply to the skin of the breast, maybe 80 or 90% comes from the breast itself. So when you suddenly take that breast tissue away, that skin is left with basically a, a fraction of the blood supply that it's used to. And what happens when skin or any other soft tissue doesn't get blood supply? it dies, you get necrosis. But not only do you get necrosis, but you get a higher propensity towards infection. Um, so infection and necrosis are the two most kind of dreaded complications of any sort of reconstruction. And they're much higher when you put stress on the skin. So what would stress mean? It's physical stress. So if you suddenly put the full volume of an implant, uh, that reconstitutes the breast volume, the original breast volume, then the skin, which is hypovascularized, is under tension. And that tension then decreases that already compromised blood supply even more. And so um, we want to avoid that. And so one of the main ways that we avoid that is by putting in a deflated expander. So an expander is essentially like a balloon. It has a silicone shell and it's got a little metal port on it and it's essentially a water balloon. And it goes in underneath the skin and we partially inflate it. And then over time, so you come in once a week or so and the nurse in the office will just put a little needle through that magnetic sensitive port and then pump, that, uh, pump some saline solution and it slowly fills up. So it takes about three months or so for that skin to develop collateral 
circulation where it's sufficiently robust where you can go in and manipulate it. So that's why we put a keep a spacer in at the earliest, typically of three months. Um, and that's why we have two steps to most of these prosthetic breast reconstructions. The initial step is just putting in a safe expander. And then over three months, you slowly expand and then you stop, you do a second surgery, which is a lot quicker. Typically I tell patients with a mastectomy and initial reconstruction, it's about four weeks for prosthetic uh, reconstruction. But with the second surgery, which is done, let's say three or four months later, that healing time is about, four, uh, is about a week. So um, that second surgery is a lot easier outpatient, but it is a second surgery. Now, again, there is a nuance, a permutation here where we sometimes do in fact go direct to implant. So that can be done when you're reasonably certain of the vascularity of the, of the mastectomy flaps. And, and this is where a little bit of what the breast surgeon does impacts what the plastic surgeon does. So if you can get oncologically clear margins, but you can leave the plastic surgeon and the patient with reasonably vascularized flaps, then you're doing two things to help the patient and your plastic surgeon. One, you're of course keeping them cancer-free, which is important. Two, you're giving them the best chance to minimize complications of flap necrosis infection and seroma and other kind of downstream uh, uh, side effects of hypovascularity. And if you do that, then the result for the patient will be better in terms of lower complications, but the aesthetic outcome will be better too. With slightly thicker, healthier flaps, then there's less issues related to kind of scarring, indentation, and, and, and rippling. And we can bring into play this idea of doing a direct to implant as well. Studies have shown that direct to implant in select patients can work well. The problem is that we can't do it in all patients. And, uh, and so for my patient population, um, typically I'll only do a direct to implant in very small breasted patients where putting in an expander that's deflated is gonna be similar to just putting in an implant of the same small volume. So other than that, I found unfortunately in my experience that the complication rates are too high. But that again is a choice where you can potentially do direct to implant in select patients and, uh, but otherwise the um, gold standard would be an expander first and then an implant several months later. And how about, um, you know, I wanna get a little closer into surgical technique here. You know, the different planes that you might place the implant in. I, now, when I was a medical student, I kind of could sense that there was a, a changing shift in, in the paradigm in the field. <laughs> Um, I remember, uh, you know, seeing a lot of sub subpectoral implants, but uh, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that prepectoral placement is becoming a little more popular now. Can you tell us about the history of, you know, from the beginning of where these implants were being placed and what plane? Yeah, so if actually if we go back, um, you know, that what that's interesting is uh, there's been a very kind of back and forth point counterpoint relationship between breast surgery and plastic surgery. So the very first health study mastectomy done, you know, in the late 1800s, that immediately created this need. Well, we've removed this woman's breast. Is there a way that we can reconstitute it? And it's funny, but um, a surgeon named Tassini almost just immediately, two years after the first health study mastectomy, came up with this idea of taking the latissimus flap and using that to fill in the defect left by a mastectomy. So that idea that one begets another has been moving along through the co-evolution of breast surgery and plastic surgery for a while. So when Cronin and Giroux back in the 60s came up with this crazy idea of putting an implant, a uh, silicone implant into the breast to augment it, the breast surgeons immediately realized, wait a second, we could use it for breast reconstruction too. And kind of um, adopted some of the, the uh, technology for aesthetic plastic surgery for reconstructive plastic surgery. And what they did was they essentially, the early on, they took the implant and put it in the same place where the breast was removed, which is relative to the pec muscle pre-pectoral. So the breast is obviously above the pec muscle. You've removed the breast. Let's go put an implant and put it pre-pectorally. But that changed 
rapidly because people realize that when you put a foreign body right underneath that hypovascular thin mastectomy flap, you get problems, infections, flap necrosis, failure, and ultimate explantation. So they came up with a better way and they said, okay, this is a foreign body. You're already thin, traumatized flaps don't like this foreign body. So let's take this foreign body. We still need it for volume, but let's put it underneath the pectoralis muscle. So then they started putting it underneath the pectoralis muscle. Now at the time, when you put it underneath the pectoralis muscle, you're trying to keep the pectoralis mu muscle intact. So you would lift up a little bit of the serratus laterally, you would lift up some of the pec muscle, but the origin and insertion of the pec muscle would stay intact and you would put this implant in. So that was the norm for a while, but then the problem was that the uh, implant itself, you could only fit in a small amount because the muscle was so tight that it was pressing down. So, so you couldn't get enough give in the muscle to give you the volume of the original breast because the muscle itself was tight. You're trying to put something in under a tight muscle. It's not going to be as big, let's say, that you might want to get to. Maybe you could put in a B cup, um, but you certainly couldn't get C or D cups routinely. So then the idea came, well, why can't we maybe use a staged approach where we sequentially put in something, but then we inflate it. And at that time, the um, technology for this existed in tissue expanders. So they would use tissue expanders um, a lot of times in burn surgery or pediatric plastic surgery, where you have these large congenital nevi that have to be resected. There's no way to close it. It's in a cosmetically sensitive area. So you would put in these, these expanders, these saline expanders that you would sequentially expand over months and that would grow enough skin, stretch out enough skin where eventually you would get enough skin to reconstitute that hole. So they took that plastic surgery device and again, put it into the breast situation and put it underneath the muscle. And so what you could do is slowly grow and stretch that muscle so that muscle now took on a larger volume, similar to what patients were used to, or, or at least to the threshold of happiness. And that was under the muscle. And, you know, I think that worked for, for actually uh, decades. Um, the problem became that um, sometimes people thought that the muscle, because you were putting the implant where the muscle was, that the muscle and where the breast was, it turns out it's offset. In other words, your pec muscle doesn't define what your breast footprint is. Your pec muscle is actually higher up. So then you would have these kind of unnatural breast reconstructions that were defined by the pec muscle because that's where you're using it. And they're very high up relative to what a natural breast would be. So somebody, uh, Andy Salzberg actually, back in 2004 and five decided, well, why don't we cut the lower border of the pec muscle and doing so allowed the uh, implant to be placed much lower. And he reconstituted the lower portion of that uh, lower pole with a cellular dermal matrix. So the idea was we're no longer subject to the tyranny of the pec muscle, the pec muscles determining where our breast is, which isn't where the natural breast is. So now we're gonna cut the lower border of the pec muscle, reconstitute it with a cellular dermal matrix and voila, we've got the inner lamella of the pec muscle and the acellular dermal matrix, and it now matches what the net footprint of the breast was. And so that was the norm for over 10 years. But as you noted, over the last few years, there's been an increasing kind of going back to the idea of going over the muscle. And the rationale for that is that as people started using more of this under muscle stuff and acellular dermal matrix, they started seeing that there were problems with cutting the muscle that have to do with animation. So when you cut any muscle, whether it's a biceps muscle, your hamstring or your pec muscle, eventually that muscle, if it's not kind of uh, locked back to its insertion, it's going to create problems from a muscular dynamic perspective in terms of function, number one, but also in terms of pain and scarring and distortion. So that's what we call breast animation deformity, where a free floating muscle, all of a sudden, because we cut the muscle to make the breast reconstruction look better, we begat another problem. And that problem was that there was some functional consequences to it. So then 
it's ironic, but after an odyssey of 40 to 50 years, we've come back full circle. We're now 40% of prosthetic breast reconstructions are now put back over the muscle again. Um, and so how can we do it now? That's different from when the failed experiment was back in 1965 or wherever. It's because the quality of the breast flaps is better. So the ability for a breast surgeon to give us oncologically durable, but vascularly robust flaps has now meant that we can revisit the idea of replacing the implant where the breast was taking out. So replacing like with like in terms of position, but that's all predicated on that breast flap being good. So again, with our breast surgeon colleagues, there's this intimate important partnership where in order for us to do what we can do best, uh, sometimes we need the ability for the breast surgeons to do what they can do best as well. And it's not always possible, but uh, you know, sometimes you have very thin patients and that, uh, that distinction is very fine. They're gonna get vascular problems anyway. Um, so that's where the decision has to be made do we go to a pre-pectoral approach or do we go to a sub-pectoral approach? So in my practice, reflective of kind of the national situation, I would say that I'm doing about a third to 40% pre-pectoral and the rest are sub-pectoral. So again, you start to see how, as you alluded to before, there's so many branch points in reconstruction. It, it, it's not just a simple, well, let's put implants in or a flap in, let's do it now, do it later. Let's put it above the muscle or below the muscle. Let's do an implant or let's do a, an expander. You start adding up all of these toggle points and you start getting you know, a fairly high degree of complexity numerically in terms of combinatorics. Absolutely. And, you know, another element of complexity is your choice of the implant itself. And I think this is something that a lot of uh, that a lot of general surgeons, you know, ha are, are only uh, tangentially aware of, but, you know, saline versus silicone implants, sh yeah. shaped, shaped implants, not shaped implants, smooth and textured. And there's a whole host of issues with, with the, you know, with that, that I'd like you to talk about, you know, yeah. about the yeah. implant types. Yeah. So, so yeah, as you said, there's, there's these, uh, you know, bifurcations, these dichotomies. So saline implants are, have a silicone shell, but they're filled with saline. So if they rupture and the rupture rates are maybe about 15 to 20% at eight to 10 years, so they can rupture with some degree of frequency, then the salt water, like a water balloon, gets expressed into the body and your body absorbs it. And so you see a saline implant rupture quite well because it, you know the breasts will flatten out after a few days. And then you could go ahead and just replace it. With silicone, the benefit is that it feels, if you, if you feel a saline implant and you feel a silicone implant, a silicone implant feels more natural. It's ironic because it's made out of a more artificial material, but it feels more natural. The problem from a safety perspective is if it ruptures, since your body can't absorb the silicone, it stays right in the pocket. And as it stays in the pocket, you, the doctor or the patient, we don't know that it's ruptured. So what can happen? Well, over time, that silicone can form a kind of a, a granuloma or fibro uh, fibrosis around it. So you can get indentations, lumpiness. Silicone can also migrate through the lymph nodes. And there are examples of patients being distressed because they've got silicone um, in their axillary lymph nodes from a rupture. The controversy that's existed with silicone though is, is does it cause autoimmune diseases? So back when Connie Chung and, and we had the old Dow Corning implants, there was this big brouhaha uh, eventually leading to a moratorium on implants, no more silicone implants and only saline implants. And then that moratorium was lifted because more data, um, specifically a, a large scale meta-analysis with the Institute of Medicine seemed to show that there was no increased risk of autoimmune diseases with um, implants. Now that that's being revisited and there are some large sales studies with, a, a, again, with larger data sets now from, from the early 2000s that seem to suggest that uh, there can be a very small association with certain things like fibromyalgia, Sjogren's disease, rheumatoid arthritis with uh, implants. 
The problem is that, again, cause and effect is very difficult when you're dealing with very small perturbations in the, in the um, relative risk. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's still very kind of difficult to see. And, um, you know, there are patients who come in saying, listen, I, I had implants. After I had implants, I started getting, you know, all these illnesses. Can you just take them out? And of course, as plastic surgeons, we, we try to give them the literature on it. But we also say there's a point at which we don't know. And so if you're feeling like you need to have them taken out, then I always respect my patient's wishes and we'll take them out. Um, so that's kind of one issue, the issue of ruptured silicone and saline. You know, what's ironic is that when I give my patients the choice, so I go over all the risks and benefits and before their second stage surgery, I ask them, well, you know, given the information I've, I've, I've presented, what would you choose? 90% of my patients still choose silicone, even though it clearly has a lower safety profile. And it's because the... Uh, silicone just feels and looks more natural. And after what they've been through, um, I think they want to get back to normalcy as much as possible. And the saline implant just doesn't feel as good. It doesn't look as good. You know, there's a little bit more rippling along the edges. Um, and, and with the silicone implants, the, you know, you can detect ruptures with imaging. So the uh, FDA recommends an MRI after three years and then every two years thereafter. So that's the official recommendation or guidance for how to manage uh, imaging for these ruptures. And if they're ruptured, you just take it out. It's generally not a big deal um, and uh, you can replace them. Now this, there's a separate issue. So there are round implants that are round and then there are implants that are round but they have a teardrop shape. And so shaped implants versus round implants has been something that um, has been a choice for a while. The, that choice is going away because in order for you to keep a shaped implant with a certain teardrop polarity in the breast pocket without shifting or moving. So it doesn't flip around, you know, and you don't have correct. the tail of the breast suddenly pointing down. Correct. You have to, put, you have, to uh, have a textured coating around it. And so the problem, so all shaped implants need texture. So what's the problem with texture? It's turned out that texturing can induce a rare form of lymphoproliferative pathology that sometimes can progress to frank cancer, ALCL. Uh, it's a type of lymphoma. And that lymphoma is extremely rare but depending upon the type of texturing, so, so it turns out the more aggressive the texturing, and there's different types of texturing based upon the manufacturer, the more aggressive the texturing, the higher the instance. And this instance may be as high as one in 3,000 or so uh, implants developing this lymphoma. It's a very treatable lymphoma. Uh, the, it's not chemosensitive. It's not radio, radio sensitive. It is uh, amenable to surgical extirpation, however, and with... Uh, reasonable success rates in the 80 to 90 percent uh, uh, long-term survival, but it is a cancer. And so for patients with breast cancer or patients with cosmetic implants that are concerned about the illness related to implants, this is a potentially devastating issue. And so because of that, the FDA has put a moratorium on, on using textured implants, a recall, so to speak, and plastic surgeons have responded, even though textured implants are still in, in the kind of uh, theoretical marketplace, nobody's really using them anymore because of that issue. So because textured implants are out, shaped implants are out. Um, there are new types of texturing that are coming on the horizon that may have less of that risk. But um, again, that's where some of the intersection between new technologies and outcomes are coming into play. Yes. Um, and just for the, you know, the general surgery listeners out there, breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma, BIA, LLCL, I've seen it as a test question before. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Kim, but, um, you know, the, the buzz phrases would be a, a, like a, a delayed or late appearing seroma. Mm -hmm. And uh, the right answer would be to send a sample of both the um, implant capsule as well as a sample of the seroma fluid itself. 
you'll definitely want to make sure to send it fresh for flow cytometry. And uh, if they get in the weeds, which I've seen the questions do this, you'll be looking for CD30 um, T cells. Yeah, ironically, this is this is a question. I mean, it is germane to a breast surgeon because oftentimes you may be seeing these patients on follow-up even more so than the plastic surgeon. So anytime you see a seroma that's uh, what we call a late seroma, so something more than six months or so, um, and a seroma just means a fluid collection, then you should check that fluid collection for uh, exactly like you did, you said, um, uh, CD30, flow cytometry, and you should get the um, imaging done, and then you do a referral with a plastic surgeon. But if you get this lymphoma, so if it comes back suspicious for a lymphoma, then that surgery generally is a surgical oncology issue where the extirpation is done by the um, uh, surgical oncologist breast surgeon. Now, what's interesting though, is like some people will say, well, okay, do you reconstruct after that? And of course, the safest thing is to say no, but there are patients who say, no, you know, I want it reconstructed. So what would you use? You use your own tissue or, or saline implants uh, that are smooth. But what's interesting is that removing the textured implant itself, if you were to do it prophylactically, it doesn't protect you permanently from risk. So the fact that the textured device was in there for any period of time means that it is still possible for you to develop um, ALCL afterwards. So that's important to know. So patients who come in say, oh, I heard about this. I want these textured devices out. They put in smooth or they do nothing at all, or they put in autologous, they're still at risk for this um, ALCL. So it's important to note that. And I do agree that that CD30 is a test question that can come up. So it's important to kind of know that as well. There's one last kind of complication I wanted to discuss with you in regards to prosthetic reconstruction, um, because it comes up a lot for plastic surgeons, but I think that um, General surgeon, general surgery trainees um, often don't think about about this as an issue, but but capsular contracture, um, you guys talk about it all the time. It um, kind of dogs, you know, the the implant world. Can you tell us wh so, why that happens, when that happens, how we can prevent it? Yeah. So, capsular contracture is the phenomena where an implant that's in a breast, either a reconstructed breast or a cosmetic breast, develops a hard fibrous capsule around it. Um, it's unclear why this happens because oftentimes this can happen uh, after the surgery by many months, sometimes years. And the prevailing hypothesis is that it comes from one of two pathways. Number one, from subacute kind of hematomas early on that created a nidus for inflammation and eventual fibrosis. Or number two, a, an infection and biofilm that's related to the implant itself that over time harbors enough bacteria that they develop a um, film around the implant and that induces an inflammatory response that, that causes capsule contracture. So if that implant happened, if it gets firm like that, then uh, there's grades of capsular contracture. And if it's a low grade, then sometimes a combination of massage and leukotriene receptor antagonists like Singulair uh, has shown some efficacy. Um, and as long as it's a grade one, a low grade, you know, you may just kind of leave it as is. As it gets to grade two, three, four, progressively more tightening, more pain, then treatment may be mandated. And that treatment basically consists of removing the implant, breaking up the capsule or removing it in its entirety, and then putting the implant in a different pocket Again, the idea being if biofilm or infection is the issue, then you want to get it out of that hostile environment and put it in a less pathogen prone environment. So if you had the implant under the muscle, you would put it over the muscle. A neo subpectral approach is actually the, the technical term. Or if it was above the muscle, you would put it under the muscle. And then you would put them on leukotriene receptor antagonists again. But in reality, once you get capsular contracture, there's a high recurrence rate. So it's about a 20% recurrence rate. So that's something to consider. So autologous breast reconstruction, you had started talking about this a little earlier. 
plastic surgeons frequently use the, the skin and, and soft tissues of the patient's abdominal area. Um, and, you know, commonly we hear the terms tram and deep. And I, I know that, um, that sometimes these get confusing. What, what do these stand for? And what is the difference between the, a tram breast reconstruction and a deep re breast reconstruction? So generally you're using tissue from your abdomen. That is the first line, if there is enough. And so that's the soft tissue coupled with the blood supply. And that blood supply is a deep inferior epigastric artery. So the TRAM was the traditional way. It stands for tra transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. So it's the muscle, which is the transverse rectus abdomin or the rectus abdominis muscle, and that goes up down. But the skin that it supplies blood, su uh, blood to it actually goes transversely. So you're taking out a swath of skin from the belly button to the pubis, almost in a triangle on both sides, and it ends up as an ellipse, and you're taking that connected to its blood supply, which is the muscle. And before there was microsurgery, uh, and a gentleman named Hartranch uh, out of uh, Emory popularized this, you would take this transverse skin and fat island connected to its vertical muscle supply, and you would take that whole thing and you would move it from its belly and tunnel it underneath the inframammary fold into the breast, pop it into the breast, and that volume would be inset in there. And the muscle served as the carrier for the blood supply to that tissue. Then people started saying, well, you know, with the advent of microsurgery, is it possible that we don't just tunnel it under there? Can we just disconnect it and then reconnect it? So that became what's called a free tram. And what typically would happen is that vessel, the deep inferior epigastric artery and vein would be cut at its, um, off, off of its takeoff from the iliacs. And then it would be plugged in originally into the thoracodorsal artery and nerve. But then increasingly, because of aesthetics really and access, people started taking a little bit of the rib away from the second or third inner space and then getting to the internal mammary artery and vein, and then reconnecting it that way using microsurgery. Now that typically a, a, what we call a pedicle tram, which is the old fashioned tram where we keep things connected. That takes, you know, maybe a couple of hours or, you know, two, three, four hours to do. Um, the microsurgery takes anywhere from four to eight hours, depending on how complicated it is. So one of the downsides of that free tram approach was that you're taking all of the muscle. So if you take the muscle from your core muscle like that from the um, uh, abdomen, then you're weakening it. The risk of diastasis or hernias um, is a little bit higher. So somebody, um, Koshima was the original founder of this, but then other people like Blondiel popularized this. Um, but they started looking at a way to uh, separate the blood supply from the muscle and so they call that a perforator when all you're doing is isolating the blood supply. So you have to actually dissect tediously, fastidiously, the vessels from the muscle, separate it from all the muscle, and then you do the same thing, reconnecting it. And then between that free tram where you just cut and take the whole muscle and reconnect it here, and just that pure perforator where you've dissected all the muscle away, there is a hybrid where you take just a small part of the muscle, um, but you don't do all of the dissection, that's called a muscle sparing tram, free tram. And why would you do that? Um, because the more you dissect the vessel away from the muscle, the higher chance you can injure. You know, these are very friable vessels, it takes time. So sometimes you can save time and expediency and preserve you know, most of the muscle uh, but maintain the integrity of the vessels, and that's called a muscle free trend. And so the general trend has been moving more and more towards perforator based flaps. And so more and more people are doing deeps, and it's rare to have pedicle or free trends or even muscle sparing free trends now. Now, that's with the abdomen. There is also alternate blood supplies that, you know, you can just think of any with microsurgery, any soft tissue that's supplied by an artery and vein that you can dissect can be 
a potential donor. So there is also a superficial inferior epigastric artery, which goes above the muscle. And so that could potentially be a, an option uh, where you don't even have to touch the muscle. You don't have to dissect it free. The problem with that is the, the anatomy can be variable and the dissection can be a little bit more tedious and the microsurgery can be harder and the outcomes can be a little bit worse. So a higher chance that you get thrombosis or you get loss of the tissue. In general, most experienced microsurgeons, when they do this sort of surgery, the chance for success is high, 95% uh, plus. But again, you can have a 10 to 15% reoperation rate where what happens? These are tiny little vessels. They can get clots in them. They can kink. They can twist very easily. And then what happens is the, if the flap gets compromised, you have to take them back emergently. Now, their overall health is generally not at risk. So we're talking, when we talk about thrombosis, we're not talking about systemic circulation. We're just talking inside the ecosystem of that flap. Um, but if you don't salvage that, then the flap dies and the patient underwent, you know, multiple hours of surgery for nothing. And then you have to go uh, more. Other alternate techniques are, that are gaining some momentum. Let's say you have a patient who's thin. She doesn't want implants, but she wants her own tissue. Sometimes you can take it from the um, thigh. So there are, again, that whole principle, wherever you have a reasonable blood supply to a reasonable amount of soft tissue, you can take those vessels, disconnect that as a composite with the flap and put it up there. And so with the thigh flaps, um, you're using um, vessels off of the inner, inner muscles of the thigh, the um, pudendal artery, perforator flaps called the pap flaps. The, um, there's different uh, flaps that you can also take from the buttocks, um, from the superior, uh, gluteal artery perforating um, flaps. These can all be taken, but again, they're considered a little bit more of a secondary option uh, to the first line abdominal option. There's also another class of kind of non-microsurgical flaps that we haven't come up that, that we don't discuss, but that's used quite frequently, and that's called the latissimus flap. And so that is a using part of the muscle of the latissimus, which is the back muscle here that helps uh, in terms of shoulder abduction. And you think of the pull down approach, when you pull something down, you're using the latissimus. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take the muscle as a pedicle muscle like the tram with some of the skin and the fat and we'll tunnel it underneath the arm and bring it out here. Now, the problem with this is that it doesn't have normally enough volume for it to represent a whole breast in and of itself. So we'll have to supplement that with an implant. So unlike you know, situations where from the abdomen where we're generally just using that in its entirety with the latissimus, oftentimes we're still using an expander or an implant to, to give us a, additional added volume. And there are variations of this where we don't take the muscle and we just use perforators to it too. So there's a host of autologous options, but those are the real central ones. Abdomen, deep first, sometimes a superficial inferior epigastric artery, then the thighs and the buttocks um, for other types of microsurgical options, perforator based. And then for non-perforator based, the latissimus. Now the benefit of the latissimus is that you do get a little bit, because you're using a hybrid approach, you get a little bit more of a um, nuanced control over a kind of volume as well, since you can control the volume. And the surgery is a lot quicker um, because you're not doing microsurgery, you're not cutting into vessels here mm -hmm. in the chest. So oftentimes the surgery can be done in two hours or less. And uh, healing time is commensurately shorter than if you did microsurgery. What about, um, you know, I, I know that fat grafting can be used for, you know, to, to shape up the contours of the breast. Do people ever use fat grafting to provide, you know, like a significant amount of the volume that you're looking for in a patient? Yeah. So another kind of um, idea, as you alluded to, was kind of, well, without just taking that tissue as a block connected to a vessel, can you just suck out some fat like you do with liposuction, take those cells and place them in here? So the answer is yes, you can. And the, but the problem is 
because these are individual cells that then have to be placed on a vascular bed and then have to engraft, um, you have two problems. Number one is um, the volume is much less. So a typical volume of a breast reconstruction is dependent on how much breast was there, but it could be 400, 500 cc's of implant to replace a reasonable volume. And the problem with fat is it's extraordinarily hard to put in more than 200 cc's of fat. And of the fat that is put in, I would say about half will dissipate. So if you are putting in 200 cc's of fat through this fat grafting technique and half of it's gone, you only have 100 cc's. So that's one fourth or one fifth of what a normal breast volume is. So it's, it's the, the math is not very good in being able to completely replace a breast with fat grafting. So it's relegated really to a secondary role of just helping with contour, filling in some hollowed area defects or some rippled areas, or giving a little bit more of a texture benefit. So for radiated tissues, there are stem cells within the fat grafts that help to nourish and, and regenerate some of the damaged radiated skin. So it, it takes on a kind of an ancillary, almost cosmetic role. But again, one thing that's important is to note is that for all of these reconstructive procedures, even though we're talking about kind of fine tuning, balancing, and we keep talking about looks and cosmesis, it's all covered by insurance. So all of this is mandated to be covered. And even if there is surgery done on an unaffected non-cancer contralateral breast, that symmetry procedure that may be done by the surgeon uh, is also covered. So that's something that uh, was part of the um, a Clinton um, legislation, Clinton era legislation, which mandated that reconstruction of a mastectomy and the contralateral symmetry procedures all have to be covered by insurance. So many of our listeners are going to be residents. They're going to be perhaps covering shifts in the ICU, and um, they will potentially see um, free flap patients um, recovering right after surgery in their ICU overnight. Um, can you talk about what kind of monitoring you're giving these, these deep flaps um, in the ICU? What, what sort of monitoring modalities are you leaving behind in the operating room? What are you looking for in the ICU? Um, and what do you do when things aren't looking? Um, what do you uh, what do you do when things aren't looking as uh, as smooth as as they can be? So uh, as we alluded to earlier, the critical thing is maintaining flow. And so, how do we measure the fact that through this anastomosis that we've made, and and the anastomosis is done with you know typically eight o or nine o uh, suture. They're very fine anastomosis, uh, so it's very prone to potential mechanical kinking or compression, so you have to be careful. And so the monitoring is done two ways. One is clinically. So we look for things like uh, how the skin tone looks. So it should look reasonably flesh colored. It shouldn't be pale. Pale means a lack of arterial blood flow. And it shouldn't be engorged in purple, which means venous congestion. So there's an artery and a vein that are connected. So you could have a problem with the arterial anastomosis, not enough kind of inflow, or you could have a problem with the venous anastomosis, which is a little bit more common where you don't have enough outflow. So how will that manifest? The flap will get engorged and more purple when there's venous problems, and it'll be pale um, with, with arterial problems. And so how do you manage that? So clinical examination, looking at the color, the temperature, laying your hands on it and feeling it should, it should be close to um, the warmth normally that you have in the tissues and the surrounding tissues. And then you could also do little pinprick tests. So the pinprick test, you take a small gauge needle and you pinch um, and you poke it into the skin. And if kind of red blood comes out, that's great. If you don't get blood coming out, that means there's a sign of arterial inflow. And if you get a lot of dark purple blood coming out, that could be a sign of venous congestion. So clinical exam is one. It's still considered gold standard, but I think there's some uh, monitoring techniques that are becoming more important. There's monitoring by oxygenation. So bioptics is a type of, um, you know, where you look at the oxygen saturation and, and the perfusion that way, hypoxemia or not of the flap. There's also something called a venous 
Doppler. So it's a little Doppler probe that's attached with a, uh, with a plas plastic cuff around the vessels themselves. So just like, with a, just like with any other Doppler, you hear the flow. So you're using your sound to get a sense of how much flow there is. So those would be two of the more common kind of adjunct monitoring techniques. So what happens if there's a problem? If there's a problem, then the ICU resident should notify the plastic surgery resident right away. And then oftentimes if that problem is confirmed, then they have to go straight back to the OR. And like I said, that might happen 10 to 15% of the time in these cases with salvage being done, I would say most of the time, but again, it's a little uncertain. And if you have a problem, the earlier you detect it, the better it is. Because what happens if you get, for instance, venous congestion over time, you start to get the kind of the downstream impact where you get loss of the microvasculature and the capillary beds. And if you get thrombosis in there, then the flap is gonna die even if you reconstitute flow. So it's important to get flow back right away. Um, to your second question as to, you know, what are some things that have to be monitored or how do you kind of maintain the health of these flaps? Perfusion is important. So there is some controversy as to whether, uh, you know, um, pressors can help maintain blood pressure, but generally what we, what we want is fluid uh, to be used, fluid, colloid, blood as needed to try to help maximize uh, DO2 to these flaps. And um, oxygenation is, you know, predicated on how much blood flow there is. So maintaining a good perfusion is important. Maintaining a good uh, hemoglobin level is important for these flaps as well. Maintaining warmth so they don't vasoconstrict peripherally. Um, uh, these are the two main things that we want to maintain. So you don't want to really keep them euvolemic to 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 a normal amount. You, you really want to make sure that you're using fluid to keep their blood pressures elevated enough to perfuse these flaps. And when is the danger point over? So it's when these vessels re-endothelialize. So four to five days, typically, um, there is some kind of early um, recovery-based protocols that are sending some of these patients out before that four to five day time. Um, and there's still some ongoing data around it. But but I would say most centers are looking to keep the patients in the hospital for at least four or five days to make sure that the patients are doing fine, well enough, and the flap is okay um, before sending them now. But they, they might spend uh, one night in the ICU, or if you have a flap monitoring unit, that's more of a step down, uh, that would be an option, but one to two days in the ICU and then transfer to the floor. Is heparin or anticoagulation ever a part of the post-op care? It is for most plastic surgeons, but there is, you know, people used to use Dextran. It turns out that Dextran has some complications with it. People have used aspirin, people have used sub-Q heparin. Um, so I think it, it, that's still very surgeon dependent, um, but I think some degree of anticoagulation is what we use at Northwestern and most of the other major uh, academic medical centers. Well, uh, maybe we'll just hit up on one last thing. That would be uh, nipple reconstruction, because often the patients um, don't have, um, uh, you know, a nipple at the end of the, the primary breast reconstruction if they've had a skin sparing mastectomy. Uh, how do plastic surgeons um, put the nipple back? Yeah, so there's actually three options. One is some patients don't want the nipple. You know, they've hated the projection of it. They don't like the visibility and they want to go flat. And I think that's a reasonable number that want that. A second option is to do what's called a 3D tattoo. So there are now uh, really nice 3D tattoo techniques that give the optical illusion of three dimensionality, but they're geometrically flat. And those uh, are generally done sometimes by an esthetician, sometimes in the surgeon's office, sometimes they're outsourced. Um, and the third option is to actually create a little nipple butt. And that can be done with some creative ways of uh, essentially like origami. So you make some two dimensional cuts along a flat surface, and then you lift and you raise and you turn and you kind of uh, rewrap and refold that two dimensional cut into a three dimensional uh, object. 
and then you let that heal and then you can actually tattoo around the areola later. Uh, I would say that they, it used to be a very common part of our practice, but because of the advent of 3D uh, tattooing and the fact that patients, this is a, a surgery essentially, even though it can be done in the office, it's another procedure done generally six months or so after the last definitive structural reconstruction. It's just yet another procedure and a lot of patients would prefer not to undergo more surgical procedures. So I think that I've noticed the popularity of this is falling off and a lot more people are doing 3D uh, nipple tattooing. But if you go on any um, website where you look at before and after pictures, I think the ability for you to have a reasonable nipple um, reconstruction, whether it's tattooed alone or with a nipple reconstruction and tattooing, I think really changes the aesthetics. And again, the whole point of all of this is to try to give a patient their sense of normalcy back and to um, give them the self-confidence. And sometimes it's hard. If you've got a skin sparing mastectomy scar going straight across the breast like that and there's no nipple, it can, it can look still fairly scarified um, in a way that's gonna be distressing. So I think nipple reconstruction is definitely something we offer. Um, and then the, you know, we can take a more invasive or less invasive approach. Well, Dr. Kim, thank you. You have taken uh, so much of your valuable time today to, to talk with us. Are there any parting words that you'd like to share to our listeners? I mean, uh, you know, our audience is, is principally general, surgeon, general surgeons and general surgery trainees. What, uh, from a plastic surgeon's perspective, should we really be taking away from, uh, from you today? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, we are plastic surgeons. We are intimately um, connected to the breast surgeons when it comes to breast cancer reconstruction. And um, knowing that we're working together on this, that we as the plastic surgeons are certainly secondary to what the life-saving kind of um, interventions you're providing. But that um, if we work together, if we can have, uh, some sensitivity and respect for what each of the parts has to be. And for us, kind of maintaining that fine line between kind of uh, oncologically sound, but um, vascularly robust flaps, are, it, it goes such a long way in helping us uh, mutually take care of our patients. And I think just being aware of that and, uh, and also being aware that if there are kind of issues, because there are so many nuances and oftentimes the breast surgeon has that kind of initial um, impact and more primary significance. I think the breast surgeon should feel like they could advocate for the patients and, and, and send the patients towards a pathway, especially if these are all very bewildering in terms of skin sparing, nipple sparing, in terms of radiation, not they can also coax the patient into a pathway that they think is more clinically sound because it's not always uh, about the cosmesis. There may be other concerns that a plastic surgeon is not aware of. So I would say um, not only to take a little bit more uh, understanding of the um, uh, mastectomy flap process, but also to take a little bit more engagement with the actual choice of reconstruction. And I think that that is something the plastic surgeons would very be amenable to if a breast surgeon were to say, listen, you know, John, I, I really think in this patient, it would be best to delay the reconstruction or this patient would be better for a flap. I think giving some of that guidance, I think would be part of a welcome communication as well. 